Welcome to you, Kirk. We're so glad you're here worshiping with us this evening from wherever you are. We're really glad that you're here. So we invite you in this space to set aside whatever is stressing you out, whatever is causing you anxiety, whatever is causing you fear, and be here in this space. Take a deep breath. Inhale. Exhale. Welcome to worship. We're glad you're here. Let us worship God. Listen for the call to worship. God, we've come here to give you our whole selves. We trust you. Let the troubles we face fade into the background in this moment. Clear our minds so we can focus on you. Teach us your ways. Show us your paths. God, we've come here to give you our whole selves. Let us worship. Join me in prayer. Lord, as we read scripture, we admit sometimes we don't understand the stories and the passages we read. Sometimes we ask questions of it and are left searching. Sometimes we simply don't know what to say. So now we ask for help from your Holy Spirit, help for understanding, help for our questions, help to find words, and help for how to apply your word to our lives. For guidance and wisdom, we give you thanks. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Acts 9, 1 through 9. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture is a continuation of what Nolan just read. This is the next part of the story of Acts chapter 9. Here are verses 10 through 12. Hear what God is saying for the church. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he answered him, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. And at this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many things about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer? Holy God, for the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight, our rock and redeemer, spirit and sustainer. Amen. So what does it take to change your mind? What would it take for me to change your mind, to really have you think differently about a topic or about something that you hold fast to? I mean, I think we all want to think that we're super flexible and able to have our minds change, but in this day and age, it's becoming increasingly difficult. It's hard to change someone else's mind, let alone our own. We hold strong to our opinions and our values 
so tightly and take any question of them as a threat. And so we start to hold our opinions as absolute truths. And maybe if we're really honest, we don't really want our minds to change. If you had the chance to watch any of the debates last night, you might see this as true. Not everybody wants to have their mind changed because we don't wanna be wrong. We don't wanna be put in a position where we're vulnerable or embarrassed or where our beliefs could be challenged. My first semester of seminary, they gave us a book called How to Be a Pastor. And when I went to seminary, I wasn't going to be a pastor. I was sure of that. I held that belief as truth. I was going to be an educated voice in the interreligious dialogue. And I used that over and over in a very pretentious way. And yet, here I am behind a pulpit as a pastor. So clearly, sometimes we need our minds to change. Because the reality is we, we need that challenge. We need to be reminded, we need to be pushed against in what we believe and what we hold fast to, to see if these things really have roots. One way or another, we need our assumptions and our held fast opinions challenged. We need to see if they are something meant to hold on to. And our scripture of Saul today is one of challenge. It's one where he is challenged across the board. When we meet him in verse one, he thinks that he's doing God's work. He thinks that God's work does not involve the Jews. And so he takes it upon himself to defend God against the Jewish people. His belief is so strong that he is taking Jews and imprisoning them and torturing them and killing them. So when we encounter him, he's on his way to Damascus to continue this work to challenge a group of believers who are gaining converts in synagogues and to arrest them. He is so zealous in this faith. He is so sure that he is willing to go through violence to protect it. And then he has a moment where everything changes. There is a voice and a light and he is struck down and he hears the voice of Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And with that, things begin to change. He is struck blind and has to decide what he's going to do in the next steps of his life. And he's given this moment where his hard held beliefs are challenged. What many would call a conversion moment. And for some of us, this word conversion is a tough word to use because it holds baggage of shame and guilt and sometimes force. But in this space, and in this story, we see conversion not as something that Saul is lacking, but as something that points us to who God is in this story. In this conversion moment with, with Saul and Jesus' voice ringing in his ears, God breaks into the story of Saul and reminds him that he is not made for death, but for life. And maybe you've had a similar moment where you have been challenged and changed, hopefully not one that made you blind, but one that called you to be something different, to move in the world differently. Because that is who God is. That is what God does. God breaks into our complacency and our fragility and reminds us of who we are created to be. And it's up to us it's up to us to then take that and move from simply remarking on today's experiences to responding to the experience of today. Because our world is aching for us to see past ourselves and to see our neighbors, to have our own conversion moments and see how God is breaking into this world. Like Saul, we need to let the scales fall from our eyes and to see the world differently. We need to see the ways we have been complicit in acts of oppression in the world, where we have let our fragility make our decisions instead of our courage, where we have been consumed with the idea of being good Christians and good people and left people in our wake, where we have forgotten where God is calling us entirely. Like Saul, God is calling us to live a life changed 
to live a life in response to Christ's life, in response to the ways that Christ moves in the world. And yet our scripture doesn't stop there. It doesn't just stop with this one moment of Saul. After this moment, Saul goes and is met by Ananias, who prays for him and the scales fall from his eyes. It is Ananias that takes Saul and helps him on this journey. This conversion is not just about one moment. This is not just about Saul. God reveals God's self through the acts of others. We need the wider community to navigate this experience. We need these moments that wake us up, that challenge us, that call us into the world and into community. If we are willing, if we are willing to choose courage, if we are willing to choose challenge, if we are willing to let ourselves see where our lives need to be changed. We need to see where we have spoken welcome and closed doors at the same time. We need to see where we have instead posted about justice instead of moving ourselves to walk with our brothers and sisters. We need to answer the call. We need to say something. We need to open up the doors. And conversion takes time. Not all of us will have a quick moment like, like Saul did. But if we are willing to listen and see our impact and to move into this world considering our neighbors, then piece by piece, our minds and the world can change. You are all probably familiar with the hymn Amazing Grace. It's a pretty familiar one. But what you may be less familiar with is the hymn writer, John Newton. He wrote the hymn right after being ordained as an Anglican priest, but before all of that, he was part of the crew of several slave ships and was an integral part of the slave trade. One evening, though, he survived a horrific storm and woke up the next morning and felt that God was calling him to do something different. That moment challenged him to see the power and presence of God in the world. And he began to see humans differently. And after a time, he began fighting against the very things he stood for, the things like his livelihood and his belief. And with that, he became an abolitionist and moved into the world that way. He lived his life differently. He was changed and began to advocate for those whom he had persecuted. Granted, this change did not happen overnight. It took almost his whole lifetime for him to right these horrific wrongs that he had committed. But he is an example of how minds can change if we let it. So where does your mind need to be changed? Where are you open to being moved? Where does your heart need to be changed? What are the things like fragility and fear and pessimism and hopelessness driving your narrative? Where do you need to look for courage and hope and love? What would it take for you to live in the courage God has set within you? How will you remember who you are created to be and use that to step into this world to wipe the scales off of your eyes and see not only yourself, but the community around you. And how can we can move into the light of a brand new day, seeing things differently, open to change. Amen. Friends, we come to this table, this table that welcomes us in all of our stubbornness, in all of our flexibility, in all of our fear, in all of our courage. This table is welcome for you exactly as you are, whether your faith feels strong or your faith feels shaky, whether you have been here before or this is your first time. This table is ready for you because it's a table that is done in the memory of when Jesus gathered with his disciples, with his friends, that navigated their own fear and courage. 
And they gathered together in an upper room and he took bread of whatever kind and blessed it and broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body broken for you. Every time you eat it, do so remembering me. And in the same manner, he took the cup and he poured it out saying, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink it, do so remembering me. Because y'all, every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our Lord until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for all of us, the people of God. So we invite you wherever you are and with whatever communion elements you have to take your bread or whatever it is and your cup and to share in the communion feast with us. Let us pray. Holy God, who calls us and knows us by name, we give you thanks for this place, for this table, for this bread and this cup, and for the ways that you speak to the depths of us, the ways you remind us of who we are created to be. Send us out into the world to not be afraid but to remember how you are moving and how we are a part of it. Amen. kindness, of patience, of abounding steadfast love. You claim us as your own and call us your children, guiding us day and night. We come before you as your people, full of hopes and gratitude, but also full of doubts and fears. This season is accompanied by uncertainties, and it can be hard to follow your guidance. We take this time to voice the things that are on our hearts and minds, for those who are tired of navigating amongst so much unknown, for leaders who are struggling with making the right decisions, for people who are mourning the loss of loved ones or a sense of normalcy, for those who are struggling to see your love in this season, for the hurting of our world, known and unknown. Almighty, attentive God, you know the struggles of our world and you nurture us even when we do not know it. Thank you for being a God whom we can approach with frustration, with grief, with honesty, with hope. Let your goodness and mercy follow us as we go into the world, reminding us to love as you love. We pray in the name of the one who calls us to seek justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, as you go out into the world, may you love as if love is not a scarcity. 
May you hope that there is a better tomorrow. May you live as if we belong to one another because we do. And may you trust that there is nothing you can do to separate you from the love of God in Christ. In the name of the lover, the beloved and love itself. Amen. Go in peace.